A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Explain stuff. Hey everyone, Dr. D here, and in this video we are going to be covering Chapter 10 from our Genetics Essentials 4th uh, Edition textbook from DNA to Protein, Transcription, and RNA Processing. So this chapter, when you're dealing with transcription, you're dealing with RNA. And it's hypothesized and evidence suggests that RNA was the original genetic material. Believe it or not, uh, the, you know, people have always wondered where did life come from. And the best evidence suggests that DNA was not the original carrier of genomic information, of uh, heritable information. It was RNA. Why? Because ribosomes, RNA uh, enzymes are uh, possible. And in the lab setting, you can actually get RNA, short stretches of RNA that are able to catalyze themselves. So you can have RNA creating more RNA in the lab. And that's essential to uh, propagation of information is the ability to copy yourself, right? Um, right now in a cell, you have genomic DNA, right? You have the genomic information in the form of DNA. And that DNA is propagated and copied by proteins, correct? Uh, not just proteins, but uh, rRNA, tRNA, mRNA. The mRNA and the and the proteins help copy the DNA. So the thing is, how did DNA get copied before a cell existed, before proteins existed? Well, the idea is the earliest genomic information was carried as RNA. Why? Because RNA has uh, a ribozyme or enzymatic ability, it can copy itself. It's been shown in labs that RNA can copy itself. And then because RNA is less stable than DNA, DNA formed as the source of the genomic uh, information and RNA assisted in the copying of the DNA and proteins came later on, or at least that's the hypothesis. Isn't that very fascinating that that is what we think uh, how life came about. RNA was the heritable material. RNA ribozymes copied themselves. And then later on, as a more stable carrier of genomic information, DNA came about and proteins. So with that, you know, let's see how evidence builds towards that, towards that idea. But with that, let's move on with our study of transcription. This is the first part of gene expression. This is where genomic information is copied into mRNA, right? Transcription is where a gene is, comp is uh, copied into complementary mRNA. And before we get started with transcription, let's talk about a little bit about RNA itself, the primary structure, the secondary structure of RNA. So here's a strand of RNA. You can see that a strand of RNA is directional, meaning it has a five prime end with a phosphate group, much like DNA has a five prime end with a phosphate group. A strand of RNA also has a three prime end with a, with a hydroxyl group on the three prime carbon of the ribose sugar. Much like DNA, you have a sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate backbone, right? And it's this straight backbone. And the difference here, obviously, is that you have a hydroxyl group on the two prime uh, carbon of the ribose sugars. Here you see you have a hydroxyl group, whereas in DNA you're missing that oxygen. That's why it's called deoxyribose. And another difference here with RNA is that you have uracil, uracil instead of thymine. So you have A's, G's, C's, and U's, U's instead of T's. But do recall that U's still pair with A's, just like T's pair with A's. In RNA, U's pair with A's with two hydrogen bonds. 
So this is called the primary structure of RNA. The primary structure is essentially the list of nucleotides in order. But keep in mind that base pairing can still occur with mRNA, or any RNA that is. It doesn't have to be mRNA, tRNAs fold as well, and many other RNAs fold in on themselves. Recall that RNA is single-stranded usually, single-stranded so the types of double uh, the types of secondary structures you can form are when RNA loops back on itself so look at the secondary structure here R this RNA strand is looping back on itself and this is called a hairpin so you form a hairpin loop back and then there's another little loop here with another hairpin you see so secondary structures are usually uh, they in they entail a strand of RNA looping back on itself, uh, you know, and then complementary base pairing with itself forming hairpin structures. Uh, that's essentially what the secondary structure of RNA looks like. So again, here's a handy dandy table showing you the structures of DNA and RNA and comparing the two. Uh, we've already addressed all of this, but please touch on that. <clears throat> now, I bet you didn't know um, that there are so many different kinds of RNA in the cell. Uh, you've heard of mRNA. We've talked a lot about mRNA, the messenger RNA. Uh, you can find this in bacteria and eukaryotes and archaea. Uh, this is the copy of the gene. mRNA is the copy of the gene. But you also have rRNA. Remember the ribosomal, um, <clears throat> the, the RNA that's part of the ribosome? tRNA, which assists in uh, translation, uh, you can have, and we'll touch on some of these later on, but small nuclear RNAs, small nucleolar RNAs, <clears throat> microRNAs, small interfering RNAs, peewee interacting RNA, non uh, long non-coding RNA, CRISPR RNA. There's many different types of RNA in the cell each with a different function. Some of those functions not known, just like the long non-coding RNA is still a big mystery in uh, genetics today. <clears throat> so again, you have all these different classes of RNA, uh, but they all share one thing in common. They're made up of uh, the ribonucleotides, A's, G's, C's, and U's. You know, and then they can form the secondary structures. So they have different jobs. And some of them, again, are known as ribozymes. Some of these can serve as enzymes. When you think enzymes in biology, most of you think of proteins, right? Uh, you know, there's, a, there's this protein or that protein, and, and these proteins are enzymes in the cell. But you should also understand that there's another whole class of enzymes called the ribozymes. And these are enzymatic RNA. And sometimes the RNA and protein work together to form uh, an enzyme. So, for example, the, the ribosomes themselves are a ribozyme. The, the ribosomes themselves are a ribozyme because part of the uh, ribosome is protein and part of the ribosome is RNA. Does that make sense? The, um, during splicing, the spliceosome proteins, during RNA splicing, that's a ribosome. So some, some of these ribosomes are enzymatic RNA, and that RNA itself is enzymatic. Some of these ribosomes, it's a, a hybrid molecule of RNA and protein, and that's an enzyme. So the so the, the enzyme wouldn't work without its RNA component, if that makes any sense. So let's look at concept check number one. Which class of RNA is correctly paired with its function? Well, let's look. Small nuclear... Well, we didn't go through that table, right? But I will tell you that... Here, transfer RNA, tRNA. This is the one that attaches to an amino acid. Remember... Uh, we're going to talk about this in the next chapter, actually. The, the next chapter, uh, chapter 11, we're going to talk about how transfer RNAs are these small RNAs that attach to amino acids, and they facilitate translation, uh, translation during gene expression. Uh, so you may want to go through this table and learn the various functions of the different types of RNA. 
at least know the different the different functions. Uh, we're going to touch on this this one, CRISPR RNA, which is exciting new field that only in the last 10 years or so has come about, but it's an exciting new field of genetic engineering and genetic research uh, where we can edit genomes using this kind of um, technique. So again, I told you there are different forms of uh, RNA. Some are exclusive to eukaryotes. Some are exclusive to prokaryotes. You know, CRISPR is found in only prokaryotes. The others are found in, uh, some are found in only eukaryotes and some are found in both. And don't forget the central dogma of uh, molecular biology. Remember the concept of the cell, set, uh, central dogma of molecular biology? Information flows from DNA to RNA to protein. And this is known as gene expression, right? Uh, the first part of gene expression is called transcription. That's what we're going to be talking about in this chapter where DNA is copied into RNA. And then the second part of uh, gene expression is called translation. And that's where the RNA message, mRNA message is read to protein. And that's what we'll be discussing in the next chapter. And then there, there is an exception here that there are some RNA viruses that can uh, copy RNA directly from RNA. But those are the exception there. So, so you and I, our cells do not have the ability to copy RNA to RNA. Um, only, en uh, only enzymes from viruses uh, called RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, only those enzymes are able to copy RNA to RNA. Oh, and the and uh, some some enzymes from viruses can even copy RNA to DNA, like the retroviruses, HIV, for example. But you and I, we do not possess the enzymes capable of copying RNA to RNA, nor do we possess the enzymes capable of copying RNA to DNA. We only have the ability to copy DNA to DNA. That's during S phase of mitosis, where you copy the chromosomes. And we can copy DNA to RNA, can't we? That's the process of transcription, for instance. So here you can see under the electron microscope, DNA molecules undergoing transcription. So these little Christmas tree structures are essentially DNA down the middle. You see the, the main branch here is DNA. And then these, uh, these uh, or the trunk, the trunk down the middle is DNA. And then the branches off the sides are the RNA. So uh, this would be, for instance, a gene, right? This is a gene. And transcription would start somewhere over here. And you're copying the gene. And as you copy the gene from right to left, uh, the, the tail of the mRNA becomes longer and longer and longer, right? So it forms these Christmas tree-like structures. So here it is with an actual electron micrograph of the Christmas tree-like structures. And then in B, uh, the trunk of each Christmas tree is called the transcription unit, which is DNA, uh, a DNA molecule, a gene, right? And then the branches are the mRNA, the mRNA uh, complementary copy of that gene. Notice how the mRNA is short here. The branches are short here. That's because you've only copied this much of the DNA. But by the time you're here, you've copied all of the DNA. So the Christmas tree is going to be longer. The branches are going to be longer because you've copied more of the DNA as you travel from right to left, as you copy from right to left. So here in figure 10.4, you see RNA molecules are synthesized that are complementary and anti-parallel to one of the two nucleotide strands of DNA, the template strand. Here's the DNA, double-strand DNA. This is double-strand DNA in your body. One of these is, uh, here's the gene on the right, right here. This is the gene, right? This is the gene. What you need to know is that what you're doing to the double-strand DNA chromosome, you're, you're uh, unwinding it. Right, so an enzyme called RNA polymerase unwinds the DNA, and then it copies only one strand. You see, the bottom strand is being copied, and that's called the template strand. And you're reading the template strand uh, three to five because the mRNA is being built five to three, just like DNA is built five to three. 
mRNA is built 5 to 3 as well. So you see what's happening? The RNA polymerase is building on the 3 prime end of the newly synthesized mRNA. So right here, if you see a G, you're going to put a C. If you see a C, you're going to put a G. If you see an A, that's a trick one. What, it, what, what happens with RNA polymerase if it sees an A on the template strand of the DNA? It's going to put a U. If it sees a T, it'll put an A, right? So let's read what it says here about this figure. Uh, part one, RNA synthesis is complementary and anti-parallel to the template strand. Again, complementary, yeah, because you're complementing the DNA and anti-parallel. The RNA is being built 5 to 3, but it's reading 3 to 5. Part 2. New nucleotides are added to the 3' prime OH group of the growing RNA. So you see, uh, just like DNA is only built in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, RNA is also only built in a 5' prime to 3' prime direction as well. Okay, so you see mRNA is being built 5' prime to 3' prime. The non-template strand is not usually transcribed. So what's happening on the top part of this, what's called transcription bubble, the top strand is not being copied. Only the bottom strand is being copied. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the template strand, that bottom strand. Uh, the, it's the transcribed strand. It's called the template strand. And Part of that template strand is called the transcription unit. What's being transcribed? What's being copied into RNA? Well, in front of the transcription unit, in front of what's being transcribed, you have a stretch of DNA called the promoter. This is where the R RNA polymerase binds. We're going to talk about this in a minute. The promoter is a stretch of DNA in front of the gene, upstream of the gene, they call it, where the RNA polymerase binds. Then you've got the RNA coding sequence downstream of the promoter. That's the sequence that's going to be co copied into complementary mRNA. And then you need to know where to stop copying the gene, and that's called the termination site or the terminator. So let's look at a gene. Here you have DNA chromosome, uh, part of a chromosome, double strand DNA, you have a gene A, a gene B, and a gene C. Take a look. Uh, in this example, you could see that the that gene A and gene B and gene C are going to be transcribed into mRNA and ultimately into protein. But look at this. With uh, gene B, the bottom strand is the template strand, but with gene A and gene C, the top strand is the template strand. So this should tell you something important, and that is that transcription does not always occur on the same DNA strand. Uh, if you have a chromosome, some genes are, you know, the template strand is uh, the, the, the top strand, and some genes, the template strand can be the bottom strand. And then look at these arrows as well. You see how this arrow is going to the left, but these two arrows are going to the right. That means that transcription proceeds to the right with genes A and C, but it proceeds to the left with gene B. So even the direction of transcription is not uniform along a chromosome. So let's do concept check number two. What is the difference between the template strand and the non-template strand? Well, isn't the template strand transcribed and used as a uh, source of of uh, complementary DNA, so you complement the template strand and you build on it in a 5 prime to 3 prime direction and in an anti-parallel direction to form the mRNA. The non-template strand is not actually copied by the RNA polymerase. So again, the template strand is the DNA strand that is transcribed into an RNA molecule, a complementary RNA molecule. The non-template strand is not transcribed. Here we can see in figure four point, uh, sorry, 10.6, a transcription unit includes a promoter, and remember what I said a promoter is, it's a stretch of DNA upstream of the gene of interest 
where the RNA polymerase attaches. Remember, the RNA polymerase is the enzyme that's going to create the mRNA. It's going to copy the DNA into RNA. A region that encodes RNA and a terminator. So on the, on the transcription unit, you have three things in each transcription unit. A transcription unit includes a promoter. It includes the region that encodes RNA and the terminator. So you can see here, here's a gene, right? Double-stranded DNA on a chromosome somewhere. Here's a gene. You have the promoter region in yellow. You have the RNA coding region in lilac. And you have the termina terminator region in burnt orange here. Okay. Only the lilac region is going to be actually copied to RNA. You see that? Only the only the RNA coding region is going to be copied into RNA and part of part of the terminator as well not all of the terminator part of the terminator because this is the transcription stop site or the transcription termination site so you see this is your RNA transcript the RNA transcript does not include the promoter the RNA transcript includes the RNA coding region and part of the terminator. Okay, does that make sense? Again, what's the function of the promoter? The promoter is a region of the gene upstream. Upstream means, you know, uh, the away from, uh, uh, up from where transcription starts, upstream of the, the RNA coding region, where the RNA polymerase will bind. This is where the RNA polymerase will bind. But it is not actually DNA that's going to be copied into RNA. The promoter contains what are known as consensus sequences. These are DNA sequences that recruit the RNA polymerase, that allow the RNA polymerase to attach to the promoter. So what do we need for transcription to proceed? You need... Uh, the RNA polymerase I told you about, the RNA polymerase, you need building blocks. Remember in DNA, it's DNTPs, deoxynucleotide triphosphates. Uh, in RNA, you have ribonucleoside uh, triphosphates. So RNTPs are the building blocks, are the nucleotide building blocks of RNA, DNTPs, are the nuclei uh, are the uh, building blocks nucleotide building blocks of DNA so what do you need you need the building blocks RNTPs you need the bacterial RNA polymerase if you're talking about transcription of bacteria and in bacteria you also need what's called the Sigma factor this is a protein that facilitates binding to the promoter uh, when the transcription starts. So RNA polymerase requires sigma factor to bind to the promoter to, to start or initiate transcription. Here's what an RNTP looks like. Ribonucleoside triphosphate or RNTP. You have a base which is what? A, G, C, or you, right? You have your sugar. Notice how you have a hydroxyl group on the two prime carbon of this sugar. So it's ribose sugar. It's the pentose sugar is ribose. And then you have three phosphate groups, three phosphate groups. So it's a triphosphate. This is a building block of uh, mRNA or any other stretch of RNA. This is the this is the subunit or substrate, I should say, for uh, RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase requires these uh, substrates in order to build RNA by linking them together, linking these together. So you can see here in figure 10.8 in transcription, nucleotides are always added to the three prime end of the growing RNA molecule. Just like DNA, like I said before, remember with DNA we talked about DNA replication 
how the daughter strand is synthesized in a five prime to three prime direction, meaning DNTPs can only be added to the three prime end of the daughter strand of DNA. Same thing with RNA. RNTPs can only be added to the three prime end of the RNA. So, R, so it's not pictured here, but RNA polymerase is actively synthesizing RNA. And it's creating the RNA in a five prime to three prime direction, which means the bottom strand here is the template DNA strand. And you're traveling along the template DNA strand in an anti-parallel fashion. So the anti, so the template is going three to five. You're you're traveling along the template three to five. You're building your newly synthesized RNA five prime to three prime. And what does it say here? Initiation of RNA synthesis does not require a primer. Uh, unlike DNA synthesis. RNA synthesis does not require a primer. You can just start copying the DNA into RNA immediately from scratch. And as you travel along the as you travel along the the gene and you're copying that DNA, this this bubble moves down the gene. This is called the transcription bubble. And again, it's being formed the reason this unwinding occurred is because what what you can't see is this enzyme called the RNA polymerase, which is traveling along the DNA, unwinding the DNA, and facilitating transcription, right? Number two, new nucleotides are added to the three prime end of the RNA molecule. So you keep complementing the DNA with RNA, copying in a five prime to three prime direction. Then number three, DNA unwinds at the front of the transcription bubble. So you keep unwinding the DNA, you keep traveling forward, you keep tra you keep copying the DNA into mRNA. And then behind the transcription bubble, the as the RNA polymerase travels, the, the, the DNA rewinds behind. So here you can see that much like eukaryotic DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase is just as diverse. You have multiple different forms of RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Each one has a different job in the cell. Some are, some are exclusive to plants and not to animals. You don't need to know this for the uh, scope of this class, but just be aware that much like eukaryotic uh, DNA polymerase and how there, remember there were so, several different forms, RNA polymerase is the same. There are different types of RNA polymerase in eukaryotes. It's not as simple as in the prokaryotic si uh, system. And each one has a different job. Concept check number three time. What is the function of the sigma factor during transcription? Remember I said the sigma factor is required for proper binding of the RNA polymerase to the promoter during transcription, and that is to initiate or start transcription. So again, it says here, the sigma factor controls the binding of the RNA polymerase to the promoter. Without the sigma factor, you're not gonna get transcription because the RNA polymerase will not be able to attach to the promoter to initiate transcription. Again, during initiation, what else is going on? The substrate for transcription the substrate are those RNTPs I told you about. Remember the ribonucleoside triphosphates or RNTPs. These are your A's, your C's, your G's, your U's. And these are added to the three prime end of the growing RNA molecule, the growing copy of the DNA. The transcription apparatus is eukaryotic RNA polymerases. So you got the, the enzyme is RNA polymerase, the substrate, are the RNTPs, and then you copy the template strand of the gene. Now in bacterial promoters, we're kind of flip-flopping between eukaryotic and prokaryotic uh, transcription here, but back to prokaryotic, bacterial promoters contain what's known as a consensus sequence, which is sequences that possess considerable similarity at the minus 10 position on transcription. This means 
10 bases upstream of where transcription starts and DNA is actually copied to RNA, that's called the transcription start site, 10 bases upstream of that is called the 10 minus 10 consensus. And this is your Prebnow box, which reads T-A-T-A-A-T, -A 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 also known as the Ta-Ta box. Um, the T-A TAAT serves as a binding site for RNA polymerase and 35 bases upstream of the transcription start site you have your another consensus sequence called TTGACA so when you have the Tata box 10, 10 bases upstream of the transcription site and the TTGACA site you know another 25 bases upstream from that that serves as the recognition site for the RNA polymerase to bind. That's, that's how RNA polymerase knows to bind to the promoter. That's, that's why the promoter works, right? And what is a consensus sequence? It's simply a consensus of actual sequences, similar sequences. And when you line up these sequences from the promoters of different organisms, that's how you gain your, your consensus. So the consensus sequence comprises the most commonly encountered nucleotides at each site for, for different organisms. So here you can see more details about this promoter I told you about. This is, this is okay, this is the, the, the transcription start site. It's called the plus one site. That's because that's where the first RRNA the first RNTP, I should say, the first RNTP is added. So the transcription actually begins and you start making your RNA at this point here called the transcription start site. And you're traveling in this direction, copying the template strand, the bottom strand of DNA into RNA, right into the RNA transcript in a five prime to three prime direction. However, remember 10 base pairs up from that is your Pribnow box or the Tata box. And then 25 bases up from that is your TTG ACA site. So when you have this consensus sequence at minus 35, this is called the minus 35 sequence. When you have this Tata box at minus 10, that's what uh, allows the promoter to serve as a promoter to recruit RNA polymerase in order to begin transcription. And remember, you don't actually copy the DNA until you reach the transcription start site. So let's talk a little bit more about initiation. The initial RNA synthesis occurs. No primer is required. Remember, you don't need to lay down a short stretch of RNA uh, like you do with DNA replication. Um, no RNA is required. So you, uh, no primer is required because you can just start copying the DNA right away at the transcription start site. The location of the consensus sequence determines the start site. So again, it's the consensus sequence, your Pribnow box and your minus 35 sequence dictate where that plus one site is, the transcription start site is. And then that's followed by elongation, which is RNA elongation. This is where RNA polymerase is actively doing its job. It's laying down, you know, uh, those... Uh, 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 phosphodiester bonds linking the RNTPs together to form your RNA in a 5 prime to 3 prime direction. That's what elongation uh, entails. Elongation is the active process of, you know, copying the DNA into RNA. So how does transcription work? Let's go back to the beginning. Here's your promoter. This is the gene you're trying to copy. This is the transcription start site, which is the plus one site. This is your core RNA polymerase. This is uh, you, basically RNA polymerase along with a couple other proteins and known as the core RNA polymerase. Remember, the RNA polymerase can't bind to the promoter and the minus 10 or minus 35 sequences without the help of sigma factor. Sigma factor associates with the core enzyme to form what's known as the holoenzyme. The holoenzyme is the polymerase plus sigma factor. That's the holoenzyme. Once sigma factor binds to polymerase, 
the two can or the the group actually polymerase is usually more than just one protein this group of proteins can bind to the promoter then the promoter it gets un uh, uh unraveled un uncoiled uh, right the D the dna uh strands are separated that's when sigma factor uh can usually sigma factor can leave oh but maybe it's after initiation so the template strand is exposed the template strand is exposed and then the holo enzyme moves to the transcription start site it grabs the first r ntp right the first r ntp for the transcription start site and you have now initiated transcription so you're going to copy the bottom strand and you're going to start building your new strand of RNA, 5' prime to 3'. Prime. Okay, at this point, the sigma factor can get removed. You see the sigma factor is released as RNA polymerase moves beyond the promoter. So no longer need the sigma factor. And what do you do? Now it's time for elongation. The RNA polymerase core enzyme proceeds downstream and it copies, it helps to copy the, the DNA into RNA in a five prime to three prime fashion. So you can see that new RNTPs are being added to the three prime, the growing three prime end of the RNA. Conclusion, RNA transcription is initiated when the core RNA polymerase binds to the promoter with the help of sigma factor. And then sigma factor can pop off and uh, elongation continues. So during elongation, the molecular structure of the eukaryotic polymerase II and how it functions during elongation has been revealed through the work of Roger Kornberg and his colleagues. Um, so again, it's a little bit more complex than in prokaryotic transcription, but a lot of the same mechanisms uh, uh, you know, are consistent. And then you have termination of transcription. So let's look at termination of transcription. There's two main forms of termination of transcription you need to know about. Row dependent termination and row independent termination. It all depends on whether or not you use this row factor, this row protein or not during uh, termination of transcription. So let's take a look here at row dependent uh, termination. So you have RNA polymerase, it runs into the terminate, terminator site, and at the rut site you have binding of rho. Rho binds to the rut site and moves toward the three prime end of the newly synthesized RNA. When RNA polymerase encounters a terminator sequence, it pauses. So RNA polymerase pauses, allowing rho to catch up. When rho catches up, uh, using helicase activity, Rho unwinds the DNA-RNA hybrid and brings an end to transcription. So now you get everything separated here. The RNA separates from the DNA and you have uh, effectively ended transcription. And why? It was because the RNA polymerase stalled at the terminator sequence allowing Rho to catch up. Rho caught up with its helicase activity and ended transcription. Now during row independent termination, this is a slightly different uh, technique. This is where you have these inverted repeats in the terminator. You have inverted repeat followed by a string of six adenine nucleotides. So you see you, uh, an inverted repeat means that the sequence here is a palindrome, is, is, is an inversion of the sequence here. And what happens then is that you transcribe those repeats those repeats then, because they're, they're an inversion, they, they bind to each other. The, the repeats bind to one another, forming a hairpin, right? A, a hairpin, which destabilizes the DNA-RNA pairing. And then you have a stalling out at this stretch of six or seven A's. And that alone allows the RNA transcript to separate from the template, terminating transcription. So conclusion, transcription terminates when the inverted repeat forms a hairpin followed by a string of uracils. Uh, remember, uh, these, these A's and U's have only two hydrogen bonds. So two hydrogen bonds is not very strong, right, compared to a, uh, C's and G's, which form three hydrogen bonds. These A's and U's are only forming two hydrogen bonds along with this destabilizing hairpin that causes the RNA polymerase to stall and fall off of the 
uh, template strand, right? So uh, again, there's two ways of terminating transcription. One is using row factor, and the other one is by forming hairpins with these repeats. All right, before we move on to this concept here of uh, splicing, uh, let's go ahead and take a quick break time with Gizmo and Wicket, and we'll come back strong to finish off this chapter. What do you say? All right, everyone, welcome back from break time with Gizmo and Wicket. Let's go ahead and keep moving on with this chapter. Now, what I was telling you about was how transcription works, but recall that from Biology 1406, you should have learned that eukaryotic genes and prokaryotic genes are fundamentally different in one major way, and that is that eukaryotic genes possess stretches of DNA called exons, which code for protein. Uh, here you can see the ovalbumin gene uh, and how it possesses eight stretches of DNA that code for the ovalbumin protein. And that's known as the stretches of DNA called exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Again, exons are stretches of genes that code for the protein that the gene is trying to form. And in between those exons, you have stretches of DNA known as introns. Introns are non-coding DNA. So this would be called intron 1 here, intron 2, intron 3, intron 4, intron 5, 6, and 7. And the problem with eukaryotic transcription is that, let's say the promoter is up here somewhere for, you know, the promoter of transcription, RNA polymerase would bind up here somewhere. RNA polymerase would then travel down this way and copy exon 1, exon 2, exon 3, exon 4, but it would also copy the intron information as well. Does that make sense? So after transcription, the introns need to be removed by RNA splicing. This segment of RNA needs to be removed uh, in order for the exons to come together so that the ribosome can then read the exon information only off of the mRNA to form the correct protein. If you don't splice out the introns, you're not going to end up with the correct protein and the protein may not function at all. So here, same thing with cytochrome B gene. You've got exons 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. You also have intron information between. After transcription, you have to remove the intron information from the transcript from the RNA transcript in order to have your mature mRNA ready for translation. Recall though, in prokaryotes, there are no introns. So in prokaryotes, the entire thing is a giant exon. There's one giant exon. Does that make sense? So in prokaryotes, there is no need for RNA splicing because there are no introns and exons to deal with. The entire gene is an exon. Now, don't forget, what does a gene include? When I'm talking about a gene, it includes the DNA sequences that code for all the exons and the introns, the sequences at the beginning and the end of the RNA, which are not translated into protein. So when you're transcribing the gene, you're, you're going to transcribe information upstream of the gene, uh, or, or of the uh, exons, you're going to transcribe information downstream of the in the exons, you're going to transcribe the exons, the introns. So basically, you're going to end up with uh, what's called the transcription unit. That means all of the mRNA. You're going to have uh, information at the beginning of the mRNA that you're not going to need for, for uh, translation. That's called the five prime untranslated region. You're going to have a stretch of RNA at the end, at the three prime end, 
uh, that you're not going to need for translation. That's called the three prime untranslated region. That means UTR untranslated region. You got the five prime UTR. You've got the three prime UTR. These are untranslated regions. It's extra uh, copying you did that's not going to lend itself to the protein. And then remember, in the middle, you also have the exon and, R and intron information as well. You're not going to need the intron information. You're going to splice out the intron information as well. So you've got a lot of information in the transcript that you're not actually going to need for translation. So, you, you know, the gene itself includes the promoter, but do you transcribe the promoter? No, you don't transcribe the promoter. You transcribe the RNA coding sequence um, and part of the terminator. Now, with mature mRNA, you have the 5' prime untranslated region, or UTR, the 3' prime untranslated region, or UTR. You also have the protein coding region. You have introns, exons, and you have what's known as the shine dalgarno sequence which is required in prokaryotes. You see here the mRNA of prokaryotes. You have the five prime untranslated region. This means stuff you copied from the gene that doesn't actually include information for making a protein. And then at the three prime end of the RNA, you have the three prime untranslated region. Again, this means stuff you copied from the gene that doesn't actually code for protein. Three prime untranslated region. And then here is your coding part. Again, this is a prokaryotic uh, mRNA, so it's not going to include exons and intron information here in the coding part of the, of the uh, mRNA. Here you have what's known as the shine dalgarno sequence in prokaryotes. This is uh, a sequence of nucleotides, a genetic sequence that helps with initiation of translation, so the ribosome to bind correctly and the ribosome to start translation. Here's what's known as the start codon. Remember ATG or AUG on the mRNA would say AUG. This is where translation will start. Translation will start. And here's where translation will end. Remember the stop codon. One of the three stop codons will live here. UAA, UGA, UAG. One of those three stop codons will be here. A start codon will be here. This is the only part of the mRNA which is going to become translated into protein. Again, downstream you have untranslated three prime, untranslated five prime, and what's the shine dalgarno sequence? That's to help the ribosome know where to attach so you can start translation. And translation occurs 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So the ribosome would attach here. It would then copy this way to produce the protein. And um, by the way, uh, I have two videos for you. I have a refresher video from Biology 1406. Um, actually, it's two videos in one. I'm going to throw a card above right now. This is a great review of transcription and translation from my biology uh, 1406 class. If you don't recall how transcription works, uh, if you don't recall how translation works, these are great videos to watch. Um, I throw it up above in a card. Um, if any of this isn't making sense, remember it's a review of 1406 and I have a nice video. Watch that video and it'll bring you back to speed. So don't forget you need to, in eukaryotes now, this was in prokaryotes, remember prokaryotes, there is no RNA modification that needs to occur. What does that mean? Look at this. In prokaryotes, you don't need to add a 5' prime cap. You don't need to add a 3' prime poly A tail. You don't need to splice out introns. There are no introns. Remember, in prokaryotes, transcription and translation can occur pretty much at the same time. That means as transcription hasn't even completed yet, translation can begin. Does that make sense? But in eukaryotes, that's not the case. After transcription, you have a really long piece of RNA called the pre-mRNA. And that pre-mRNA pre is not ready for translation. 
it's you know in the nucleus and it's not ready for a translation remember first of all it has a bunch of intron information inside which you don't need the intron information you need to splice out the intron information secondly it's highly uh, fragile it's uh, RNA is a fragile molecule it's easily degraded so it needs to be stabilized by addition of a five prime cap and a three prime poly A tail so I'm going to explain to you what these are in a little bit, but uh, the addition of the five prime cap happens obviously at the five prime end of the pre mRNA, and it has two functions. One is to help the ribosome to know where to attach to the uh, mature mRNA, and two is to stabilize and help uh, prevent degradation of the mRNA. Secondly, a poly A tail, same thing. Uh, it helps to prevent the degradation of the mRNA by adding, you're adding 50 to 250 adenine nucleotides. So like a giant tail made of A's to the three prime end of the mRNA so that you prevent the uh, easy degradation of the mRNA. What does the five prime cap look like? The five prime cap is essentially guanine, you know, G, the, the nucleotide G, guanine, but it's called methylguanine because it has a little methyl group, CH3. This is methylguanine, and essentially what the five prime cap is during RNA processing is taking G that has a methyl group and sticking it onto the mRNA. That's it, you just stick G onto the mRNA, but there's one trick, there's one catch. It's a really weird capping because you're taking the five prime end of G, methylguanine, the five prime phosphate, and you're sticking it onto the five prime phosphate on this stretch of RNA. Did you guys follow me? The pre mRNA has a five prime end with a phosphate group, and you're taking a methylguanine and you're sticking its phosphate group onto the mRNA phosphate group. So it's a five prime, five prime bond. Uh, so essentially, this guanine is stuck onto your pre mRNA pointing the wrong way around. Well, that stabilizes the mRNA and it helps to, uh, you know, facilitate initiation of translation, the ribosome to know where to start translation. Isn't that fascinating? So that's what they mean by a five prime cap. You take methyl guanine, you attach it five prime, five prime to the pre mRNA's five prime end. And again, why do you do that? Prevent degradation of the mRNA, premature degradation of the mRNA, and to assist with initiation of translation. Then you have what's known as RNA splicing. Remember, in eukaryotes, you're going to have to cut the intron information out of the coding region, you know, the middle region of the mRNA, so that you're left with only the exons, correct? And the way, you're, the way your cells know where to splice is these consensus sequences which indicate splice sites. And these consensus sequences, each splice site, each intron, each intron has a five prime consensus sequence of uh, G, U, then either an A or a G, AGU. So it's GU, either an A or a G, AGU, at the five prime splice site, and then a three, three prime consensus sequence of CAGG, and then a branch point of which consists of A, right? This is about 18 to 40 nucleotides upstream of this three prime, this three prime splice site. And then this enzyme called the spliceosome, which is essentially a ribozyme. The spliceosome, which consists of five RNA molecules and about 300 different proteins binds in order to do the process of splicing. So let me show you this process. All right, here is the process here. You can see this would be part of your transcript. And here between, you know, this light green area is your first intron. You want to remove this intron. Remember at the five prime end of the intron, you have the first consensus sequence, the five prime consensus sequence the three prime end of the of the intron you have the other consensus sequence and then you have your branch point here about 18 to 40 nucleotides away from the three prime consensus sequence 
So this is where splicing of the pre-mRNA occurs. This is how it occurs. And remember, the enzyme that's responsible for doing the splicing out of the intron from the pre-mRNA is the spliceosome protein. Concept five, check. If a splice site were mutated, so the splicing did not take place, what would be the effect on the protein by the mRNA? Well, the protein would be way longer, wouldn't it? Because you wouldn't splice out that information. And not only would the protein be longer, it may not work at all because now you've got a bunch of amino acids in the protein, a stretch of amino acids in the protein that don't really belong there. So that's, that most likely will destroy the function of that protein. But again, here's how it works. Your splice site at five prime splice site here, your three prime splice site at the other end, uh, let's go through this one by one. The mRNA is cut at the five prime splice site. So here you cut it, cut, then the five prime end of the intron attaches to the branch point. See what happened? You cut the mRNA at exon one, you then flopped it back and you attached it to that A, you know, the branch point. Uh, then you cut the three prime splice site you've cut the three prime splice site and you've removed this loop, you see? You've removed the, you've looped out the intron. You've looped out the intron and this is called a lariat and true Texans will know <laughs> what a lariat means. It's like a lasso and that's how this structure got its name. It looks like a little lasso, you know? Uh, so the lariat is then removed. Uh, the intron has been removed as a lariat, as a lasso looking thing and then it's broken down and degraded. The intron is broken down back into nucleotides. And now you, you attach the exon one to exon two. So the spliceosome attaches exon one to exon two, and now you're ready for translation. The, the spliced mRNA is exported into the cytoplasm for translation. You see what happened there. One thing I skipped over was this slide here, which is also showing you the third modification that occurs to the pre-mRNA. Remember, pre-mRNA in eukaryotes is mo modified three different ways. The five prime cap, which is that methyl guanine five prime five prime addition to the mRNA, removal of the introns with the spliceosome at the consensus sequences. And then at the three prime end, remember there's addition of a poly A tail, 50 to 250 uh, A's, adenosines. So let's take a quick look, or um, adenines in, instead of adenosine, uh, adenines. So let's take a quick look at how this works. So here you have your pre-mRNA and where you have this consensus sequence at the three prime, near the three prime end of your pre-mRNA, you will find this consensus sequence, AAU, AAA. Now, what happens is downstream of this consensus sequence, you're going to cleave your mRNA. Pre-mRNA is cleaved at a position from 11 to 30 nucleotides downstream of this consensus sequence. So you cut the pre-mRNA off here. Then an enzyme called polyadenylase adds a bunch of uh, adenines, a, 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 a poly A tail, a poly A tail here. And you're adding many, 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 many uh, adenines. And this tail, remember, is about 50, 250 uh, nucleotides long, right? A bunch of A's. And why do you do that? Again, it's to prevent the degradation of the uh, mRNA to help st stabilize the mRNA since since RNA is a highly reactive molecule because I don't think I mentioned this before but the fact that you have those hydroxyl groups on the two prime uh, carbon of the ribose sugar those hydroxyl groups are highly reactive which makes RNA easily degraded if you're ever working in a research lab and you have an RNA project where you have RNA you're dealing with, you'll notice that you have to take a lot of precautions because RNA is so easily degraded in nature. DNA is much more stable, uh, and so DNA is less easily degraded as RNA. RNA is highly easily degraded, so to help uh, prevent that and to help counteract that, we're adding a bunch of A's. 
uh, and we're adding a five prime cap. All right, so here's another concept. You have alternative splicing in eukaryotes. Because you have different exons, you can have a, a process known as alternative splicing in eukaryotes. It's fascinating. Um, you have exon one, exon two, exon three. After transcription, what do you do? You've got your pre-mRNA, which needs a five prime cap and a three prime poly A tail. So here's your five prime cap. Here's your three prime poly A tail. At this point, what do you normally do? You you uh, loop out the introns, right? You you do splicing. Now there's different ways that you can splice in eukaryotes. You could splice so that you end up with a mature mRNA with exon one next to exon two next to exon three, which is what you would expect, and that's going to give you a certain protein, isn't it? When you when you uh, translate exon one, two, and three, you're going to get a certain protein. However, one way to diversify your subset of uh, genomic information is to shuffle exons around. Or let's say you could do an alternative form of splicing where let's say you splice out exon 2 as well. You just, you, you, you just leave out the information for exon 2. So you form a transcript with exon 1 next to exon 3. Well, if you translate this, you're going to end up with a different protein than if you translate this. So the human genome has roughly 25,000 different genes, but you have up to 80,000 plus different kinds of protein. That shouldn't add up in your brain, should it? Because remember what I said earlier, a gene is the information for a protein, right? A gene is the information for a protein. So if I were to tell you there are 25,000 different genes, you would assume that there should be 25,000 different proteins because a, a gene codes for a protein. Well, if how, how is that even possible that there's 80,000 different proteins if there's only 25,000 different genes? Well, alternative splicing is the answer. If I take the same information and I include exon 1, exon 2, and exon 3 in my transcript for, for translation, I'm going to end up with a protein that includes the information for exon 1, exon 2, and exon 3. I'm going to get the amino acids for exon 1 next to the amino acids for exon 2 next to the amino acids for exon 3 information, right? But if I alternatively splice this, uh, this pre-mRNA to exon 1 next to exon 3, I'm going to end up with a smaller protein that only includes the information uh, from exon 1 and exon 3 when I'm making my uh, polypeptide when I make my protein. Does that make sense? And that is a different protein. So I'm essentially getting more bang for my buck. I'm getting two different proteins with the same genetic information. The way I, I explain it to students, you know, in a very, very simple way, a simplified silly way, is can't you make two different types of cookies with a chocolate chip cookie recipe? Um, think about it. I could give you a chocolate chip cookie recipe and you could make two different kinds of cookies from that chocolate chip cookie recipe, couldn't you? You could follow the recipe to the T, follow the recipe, and what do you end up with? If you include all of the information in that recipe, what do you end up with? You would end up with chocolate chip cookies, right? But what if I said, okay, now leave out the chocolate chip part. Just don't add the chocolate chip right? Now you just end up with nice cookies, but they're not chocolate chip cookies. They're just cookies. Does that make sense? So you, you just essentially made two different kinds of cookies, but with the exact same information. It's just you left out the, the chocolate chip part in one batch and you, at, you included the chocolate chip part in another batch. Same thing here. You can make different kinds of proteins simply by leaving out uh, an exon. And that exon might be a, f uh, a functional group or some kind of uh, uh, portion of the protein that may be a binding site on that protein or something like that. You, you can end up with more genetic uh, variability or not genetic variability, but protein variability from the same genetic information. Isn't that interesting? Prokaryotes are not capable of doing this, obviously because prokaryotes don't have exons and introns. So again, to summarize, 
there's a lot going on here in eukaryotes, isn't there? You've got your promoter, uh, which includes the, 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 the binding sites at minus 10 and minus 35. You've got your exons that you need to trans, transcribe. So you transcribe all this information, including the exons and the introns. You then need to stabilize this pre-mRNA with the addition of a five prime cap. You then cleave the three prime end and add a poly A tail. You then have to undergo RNA splicing to remove all the introns as lariats. And you could even splice this a different way so you get different combos, the chocolate chip cookie or the regular cookie. And now you're ready with your mature mRNA. This is called mature mRNA with the five prime cap, the methyl guanine cap, the three prime poly A tail, the introns spliced out, ready to shuttle to the cytoplasm, meet up with the ribosomes for translation. Um, one thing I left out was uh, the promoter could also have other important sequences upstream here or way downstream here. These are called enhancers. Uh, enhancers are typically upstream but could be downstream. And enhancers are binding sites for different proteins called transcription factors, which could help transcription begin. So anyway, isn't that interesting? Uh, there's what's known as pre-mRNA processing, five prime cap, three prime poly A tail, intron splicing with the spliceosome. You could diversify the number of proteins you can get with alternative splicing, and all of this is eukaryotic specific. Isn't that interesting stuff? So let's talk a little bit about other types of RNA, not just mRNA, but let's talk about tRNA, for instance. The structure and processing of tRNA. Let's talk a little bit about tRNA. And remember, what is the function of tRNA? tRNA plays a major role in translation it allows translation to proceed. So what does tRNA look like? tRNA has a couple of really rare uh, RNA nucleotide bases on it, ribothyme, uh, ribothymine and pseudouridine. Um, these are rare nucleotide bases inside of uh, tRNA. You don't really need to know this in too much detail, but uh, it's included here in the book. And the tRNA itself forms a secondary structure called the cloverleaf structure. And that cloverleaf structure includes an anticodon uh, where the binding occurs between mRNA and tRNA. So here you can see this is a tRNA. And you can see the same tRNA in three different forms. Here you see each individual nucleotide of the tRNA and what's binding to what. Remember that tRNA has a, uh, or like our, all RNA has a five prime end and a three prime end, but its secondary structure can form hairpins like this. And it's called the clover leaf because this kind of has a clover leaf structure. Now, when you look at the ribbon model, you can see how it folds. And when you look at the space filling model, you can see its overall shape. So this is called the space filling model where you can see each individual, uh, each individual atom. Here, this is the ribbon model showing you the backbone of the, DNA, of the RNA, in this case, the, the RNA. And here you can see this is the flattened model. Uh, this is just showing you the individual uh, nucleotides of the tRNA. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the features of tRNA. You have the rare bases I told you about, the rare bases. You have the anticodon. The anticodon, when they talk about the anticodon loop, they're talking about these three nucleotides, one, two, three. This is called the anticodon. It will bind to the codons. So do you remember the start codon, for instance, AUG, right? AUG on the mRNA. The anticodon on a tRNA would read U, uh, A, U, uh, so UAC, UAC. The anticodon for UAC would bind to the codon AUG, uh, and that would initiate translation, for instance. So. The anticodons on the tRNA bind to the codons on the 
mRNA in order to facilitate translation. The other important part of the tRNA is this three prime end. This is called the amino acid attachment site, which is always CCA. This is where the tRNA is charged with an amino acid. And we're going to talk about this in the next chapter. We're going to talk about translation. But here's where the amino acid is attached to the tRNA at the three prime end, uh, CCA. Here's where the uh, tRNA binds to the mRNA in a complementary fashion with its anti-codon loop. Okay, so those are the two important things to know about tRNA. Next, we're going to talk about rRNA, rRNA, um, ribosomal RNA. Did you know the ribosome, which facilitates uh, translation, the ribosome is part protein and part RNA. The RNA part of the ribosome is called rRNA for ribosomal RNA. So let's talk about that. Remember, there's two subunits to the ribosome, the large ribosomal subunit and the small ribosomal subunit. In bacteria, the large subunit is called the 50S subunit and the small subunit is called the 30S subunit. They come together. I, I give the analogy like a hamburger bun, right? The large hamburger bun attaches to the small hamburger bun to form the hamburger buns together. That is the 70S uh, ribosome. So in bacteria, it's called the 70S ribosome. Uh, and in eukaryote, it's the 80S, which the large subunit is called the 60S subunit. The small subunit is called the 40S subunit. They come together to form the 80S subunit. By the way, what did I tell you? I told you that the ribosomes are part RNA and part DNA. So look at this. The large subunit in bacteria is made up of uh, what's known as the 23S um, of rRNA. This is a, a long piece of RNA. And then the 5S uh, rRNA. Here's a shorter piece of RNA. So two pieces of RNA two pieces of RNA make up the large subunit of the bacterial ribosome, as well as 31 proteins. Did you catch that? 31 proteins plus two pieces of RNA equals the large subunit of the bacterial ribosome. 21 proteins and, and one long piece of RNA, called the 16S RNA, make up the small subunit of the ribosome. In eukaryotes, 49 proteins along with one, two, three, three pieces of, of rRNA make up the large subunit and 33 proteins along with a piece of RNA make up the small. So again, the large subunit and the small subunit of ribosome is a ribozyme. It includes protein and RNA. Let's talk about another type of RNA, uh, actually two different types, microRNAs and small interfering or siRNAs, miRNAs and siRNAs. MicroRNAs are amazingly interesting. These are part of your own genome. Uh, basically, they look like genes, but after transcription, these microRNAs pair with themselves. So instead of coding for a protein, these microRNAs will kind of form a hairpin and then this uh, pre-microRNA is cleaved to produce a short RNA with a hairpin. So you cleave the hairpin off. This is your microRNA. And that can lead to a process known as gene silencing. You can then use this microRNA to turn off expression of genes. Same thing with small interfering RNAs. You have double-strand RNA. The double-strand RNA is cleaved by an enzyme called Dicer into small RNAs or sh uh, small interfering RNAs. These are small double-strand uh, RNAs, and that could lead to gene silencing. So look here, the micro microRNAs cut with Dicer. One strand of the microRNA co combines with proteins to form an RNA-inducing silencing complex called RISC. RISC which is basically a protein plus that, you know, microRNA. And then there's imperfect base pairing between the microRNA 
and the mRNA message of a gene causes inhibition of translation. So this gums up the works. MicroRNAs prevent translation of complementary uh, mRNA transcripts. So it's a way of turning off gene expression, post-transcriptional uh, inhibition of gene transcription. Isn't that interesting? Small interfering RNAs are the same, uh, but the outcome's a little different. With small interfering R RNAs, the SI RNA combines with the risk. So, and in this case, there's perfect pairing, and that leads to cleavage and degradation of the transcript. So, either way, microRNAs and small interfering RNAs, either way, they stop uh, transcript. Uh, they stop translation. They stop gene expression. So you can turn off the expression of a gene using microRNAs or small interfering RNAs. Uh, and, and so it's an interesting process. Sometimes this is done naturally. There are micro RNAs in your body right now, like in your heart, that, that need to be transcribed in order to regulate proper heart development and function. And then these can also be used in biotechnology to knock down expression or reduce expression of different proteins to see what happens in the in the lab as well. So it's really fascinating stuff. This whole world of small uh, interfering RNAs and microRNAs started with Andrew Fire maybe about 15 years ago. It's, it's a relatively new area of study, but very fascinating stuff. And we're still learning the benefits of microRNAs and small interfering RNAs today. We're still trying to figure out exactly why they're so important. Again, here's the differences between siRNAs and miRNAs. You go over this. And lastly, on this chapter, I'm going to tell you about the, the newest type of RNA which we've learned about, which is fascinating. Over the last 10 years, we've started to learn about CRISPR RNAs. You may have heard of CRISPR in the news, about how CRISPR technology is, again, it lead us towards these genetically modified organ organisms and genomes and how it's going to fix all the problems or, you know, lead to uh, designer babies and such. We're going to learn about this. We're going to learn a lot about this, but it's a, it's essentially a rudimentary immune system in prokaryotes. Isn't that fascinating? We're going to talk about this a lot, but um, basically what a prokaryote can do is take some foreign DNA some foreign DNA, like phage DNA, phage, like bacteriophage DNA. It could acquire this phage DNA as a spacer. It can place it as a sp spacer in between these palindromic sequences, and then that becomes part of its repertoire, uh, its immune system, if you will. And, and what CRISPR RNA does is that it will transcribe these... Uh, these spacers, this space essentially sequences from infections past, and those transcripts will bind to the Cas protein, which is part of the CRISPR system, forming an effector complex. The effector complex is the Cas protein plus this this uh, the spacer this spacer um, information from you know, a phage from past. And then if the foreign DNA, if that phage were to infect the bacteria again, the Cas protein would be directed towards that DNA because of binding between the foreign DNA and the spacer DNA that remembers, that binds to, that binds to the foreign DNA. So if that phage were to infect that bacteria again, that bacteria would be able to attach to the phage DNA and cause cleavage and destroy that phage DNA. Isn't that interesting? So it's a rudimentary immune system in bacteria. When a, when a bacteria becomes infected, it has the opportunity to incorporate some of that infected, um, some of that infectious DNA into its own DNA as a spacer unit you know, and, and all of these spacers represent information from infections past. Those are transcribed, paired with Cas, 
and Cass can then attack and degrade uh, that foreign DNA if it were ever to infect the cell again. Isn't that fascinating? We always thought, up until like when, when we discovered CRISPR, we always thought bacteria are so rudimentary, they, they don't have any immune system. But this is their rudimentary immune system. Isn't that fascinating stuff? Just like we never thought they had sex, right? That bacteria can't do sexual reproduction. But then we learned about conjugation and the sex pilus, you know. And just like we thought bacteria couldn't communicate because how would the bacteria that can't see, hear, taste, smell, how can this bacteria communicate? But then we learned about quorum sensing. Isn't that fascinating stuff? That you, under, you underestimate life and then it shows you uh, the difference there. Uh, anyway, fascinating chapter. Last, last slide before we call it quits. This is our, uh, you know, our, our uh, stats sheet, our epic stats sheet uh, for this model organism, the nematode worm, Cano habritis uh, elegans. And many, many labs study this worm. It's a transparent worm, so you can see right through it. They know exactly how many cells are in this worm. They know exactly how, how many uh, neurons are in this worm and what each neuron does. So it's a wonderful worm to study. It's a wonderful, wonderful model organism for study. So it, it's, not, it's wonderful because it's small size. It's easy to grow in the lab. It has a very short generation time. You can carry 200 to 1,000 eggs per female, or per, each female can produce 200 to 1,000 eggs, so a lot of proliferation going on there. Easy to culture, simple body plan, transparent, capable of self-fertilization, so they're herma hermaphroditic roundworms. They're very small. You can grow them on plates. They have chromosomes you could study. Uh, and why do we study them? Genetics uh, of development, apoptosis, program cell death, genetic control of behavior, aging, a lot of neuronal studies, neurons. And you want to know something fascinating about the nematode that has to do with siRNA? I'm going to tell you something fascinating. Remember I told you? Let me tell you a little story. Look at the siRNA. What do they do? Double-strand DNA that pair up with the the um, proteins to form the risk complex, and the risk complex shuts off... Uh, you know, translation or expression of a gene, right? You know what they do in research labs with these worms? They take siRNAs, they put them in E. coli, right, in bacteria. They then feed those E. coli to these worms. These worms eat the E. coli that have the siRNA, and then that siRNA knocks down expression of genes in the worm. Isn't that fascinating? So if you want to study how a particular neuron works in this worm, you could make an siRNA that's targeted against one of its neural genes. Put that siRNA plasmid inside of an E. coli. Have the worm eat the E. coli, and then the worm will have not only ate the E. coli, but uh, ingested the siRNA against its neural cells, it will knock down neural expression of that neural gene target, and then you could study what are the repercussions of knocking down that gene in the worm. Isn't that fascinating stuff? I mean, tell me that's not fascinating. Anyway, that leads us to the end of this chapter. I hope it was interesting. It's very uh, interesting stuff, but I could tell that, you, you know, it is it is getting kind of dense with material, molecular biology material. Hopefully it made sense, though. Let me know if you have any questions in the comment box below, and as always, I will catch you guys next time. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D. A Dr. D, Dr. D, Dr. D.